I would like to request uh, Lina Asher to join me on stage. We are not going to discuss about school education, although the chief guest is in the business of academics. And yes, she chose entrepreneurship to being a film star in the film industry. So that's Lina Asher for you. And she's a fantastic speaker, a very admirable personality, a very powerful personality who changed the academic scenario in India as a country in terms of quality and in terms of how infrastructure should be, how syllabus should be, how parents should be interacted with and how children should be taught. So we are not going to discuss academics, we are going to discuss on Lena Asher as an entrepreneur. So Lena, after schooling in your primary schooling in England and then finishing your rest of the education for almost more than 17 years in Australia, you came to India just to take experience of the education activity that happens in India. So when did the breakthrough happen that you can come into the system, try to change it and create a niche for yourself? How did it happen? Uh, the breakthrough actually happened watching my young brother um, sit on the toilet seat with uh, cricket cards. Um, he'd fail maths in school all the time, but when it came to his cricket cards, he could run commentary that had so much of maths involved that would it was mind-boggling. So I think my con concept of how kids should be educated came from that personal experience. I was sent here because I had an Australian boyfriend that my parents didn't want me to marry. And uh, so when I was here for one year, um, I was teaching at a very prestigious school in Juhu. And 55 kids in a class and content that was completely from, a, from just the previous year's notebooks. And just very, very disengaged kids, so I saw a huge opportunity to come back and, and impact how education was perceived. Friends, she began in 1993. We need to understand what is scalability from her. She is in almost every city of the country. Apart from India, she is in Dubai, she is in Qatar, she is in Maldives. She runs more than 100 schools. So how did you envision this kind of scalability in hardly a span of 23 years? Uh, no, I have made no fancy business plan. It's like I tell any kid who's got a dream or a vision of what he wants to do when he comes to me, just start. So I started with 10 kids. I started with uh, 600 square feet of space. I just started. I think when the intention is correct and your purpose is aligned with who you are, the journey kind of just takes off. So we've got to where we've got to, not because I... I'm a brilliant businesswoman or anything else. I think just driven by the sense of the purpose of what um, I was doing and really believe in. Well, that's what people say when their bank accounts are full, scalability is tall, there are more than 1,200 people working for you. <laughs> they say I'm not a great businesswoman. So that's what she's doing. So I think that's a sign of a great personality. Uh, we are not going to talk about our bank accounts though. No, no, but what, what, what the initial growth, if you understand, all the initial growth came from parents. So the first franchise that ever got set up was in Juhu, was by a parent whose kid was in my Bandra school. Delhi, kid, uh, the kid was in the Worli school. Hyderabad got set up because the kid was in the Delhi school. So it was more of a journey where people, where you could, you know, from a uh, story point of view, the story was so strong that parents really believed in the story, they saw the outcome, and they wanted to be part of that story. How could you absorb such kind of geographic expansion in a country where every state or every city has a different culture, different rules and regulations, different mindset of people, how could you expand so quickly across the uh, country like India? You want an honest answer? A very honest one. McDonald's. So I went, I woke up early one morning, so that's when I tell kids that the, the best time to get ideas is when you're just waking up, when your brain is in that um, um, beta state where it's not like really, really actively working. And I woke up one morning thinking, if McDonald's can do it and create scale with every burger tasting the same, I mean, obviously kids are very different, so it's, it's, but can I create sufficient back end to provide the American School of Bombay, because I was the only international school at the time, to provide the in, uh, bo uh, sorry, American School of Bombay experience at Indian prices. So I looked at what was expensive in the American School of Bombay, it was the teachers, you know, uh, getting um, American teachers to teach here, uh, the, the cost of stay, um, their salaries. And I said, if I create a team of people who can write the processes at the back, 
So that's all it is. It's the systems and process. Only difference is academic systems and process. Lena, that's fine. McDonald takes only two crores to establish. A school starts at 20 crores. So how can you expand 100 places because I tell good in 23 years? Because I tell very good stories. <laughs> I thought it was only for the children. You tell that to the parents also to become <laughs> no, I investors. No, I tell investors very good stories as well. <laughs> So the route to growth at an initial stage was definitely investors on board as well. Um, investors, and the franchising model. Investors in individual schools, yes, because it's a franchise model, um, largely. Uh, later on, yes, we got some investors in. In fact, uh, somebody said they're from Wellinkers. Uday Salunke. Salunke owns half a percent of my company. Um, the Mankekers um, are partly my investors. So, yeah. Kishor Biani. Kishor Biani is an investor. But... Very, I mean, I took very small investments and in fact, I'm going on a rampage to buy everyone out because I want to stay, stay aligned to my purpose. So you had a plan in place. You might not have realized that, but subsequently when you fall back and look at the last 23 years, unknowingly an automatic plan was getting created where you got investors on board, you spanned the whole country, you interacted with parents, they motivated you to start more schools. How different are you as a business leader compared to the other leaders in the similar industry? Because I'm sure this success cannot happen without effective leadership. So, again, I go back to what I tell kids. If Honestly, and, and, I, and I, I may sound like a broken record, but if you re your purpose is really strong. Um, and the reason why I tell investors um, that I want to buy you out is because every time you're pressuring me for your purpose, which is making money, I'm moving away from my purpose, which is, you know, great education. So... I know, and, and, and I've seen it again and again and again. The minute I stay aligned to my purpose, the money just kind of flows because it flows in for expansion, et cetera, et cetera. But that is the key um, to staying authentic and being very true to what your purpose is. If your tr purpose is to make money, no issue, go ahead. But, so I think I was always driven by the purpose, and that's a story that everybody wanted to be part of. So you created a fantastic system, a process, a product, a concept, and money flew, just uh, came in, that's it. And you went on expansion. Yeah. You went on expanding the And I, only, I actually only took um, external investment into the business in 2006 when I was drowning, when I had to. <laughs> but I think that was also ordained uh, by the universe. So how did you come over an obstacle? Because 2006, I remember it was a war. It was a war. And I think Times of India was selling on your news at that period of time. Uh, you were always on the third page fighting with a very powerful man. So, how did you overcome that ob obstacle? How did it demotivate you, or did it make you made you stronger to move forward in life? So, I did what I tell kids to do. Yeah, because you can keep on focusing on a problem and an issue. And for me, um, my credibility was more important than my bank balance, and it always has been. Um, so, every morning, seeing your name in the paper that ICSC says no to Lena Asher, Lena Asher, this Lena Asher, that was like, oh God, I want to crawl under a rock and die. So I did what I do with kids. What is the worst that can happen to me in this situation? So I own my Pali Hill School property and all. I said the worst thing that can happen to me in this situation is I scale back, I lose everybody else um, because everything was getting rattled. My franchises were getting rattled, everything. I go back to running that one school. I'm still alive, I'm still surviving and I will build my credibility and everything else back from there. I think the minute I shifted my thought process to what is the worst that can happen to me in this situation, everything else started happening again. So what is that one great learning apart from this? That every obstacle can be a stepping stone if you see it that way. It's what happened to me in 2006 that forced me to build my first own school. So in some sense I have to thank so that calamity was actually an opportunity in the waiting for you. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's just, you know, there's a, the, the saying that I love the most, which I keep telling kids about is, change the way you look at things and the things you look at change. And, um, you know, um, people would st had started all these um, companies, creating curriculum, uh, poaching my staff, poaching my teachers. And I said, you know what, why don't I start a training um, 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 where actually train teachers and curriculum developers and send them out into the world. Because at the end of the day, if I go back to my original purpose, was to change the face of education in India, to spread the right sort of thing, I'll do it one way or the other. When you started the concept of Kangaroo Kids and uh, Billabong High, it was a new concept that the city was witnessing. I'm talking about Mumbai because I saw you here. And uh, I'm sure a lot of good teachers left 
other good schools and join you because of your aura, because of your storytelling to them probably. So they left them and they joined you. How did you face poaching when lots of international schools started mushrooming across the city and they started poaching your team? How did you restrict your team from deserting something on hands which might damage your institution and go to somebody else just because they're paying double? So to be honest, I have had a lot of churn in those days when suddenly school went from being something that you did as a cause to it being a business. So I experienced a lot of churn. Uh, I can't compete with uh, the Dhirubhai Ambani school and their pockets, etc., etc. Um, so one is I started my own training arm where I would train teachers and send them out. So now I train teachers and my teachers go and teach in Dhirubhai Ambani. So I've started a, a, another business uh, uh, offshoot. Secondly, I have the power that a, a Dhirubhai Ambani school doesn't have, which is lots of schools. I've got a brand story, which they don't have. They have deeper pockets, but I have a brand story. So you have to focus on what you've got. So if I've got a brand story, then I can build a career story for every teacher. So when a teacher comes in, um, the first thing I would ask her was, where do you see yourself five years from now? So if it's in a curriculum department, then, I, then you start training her in that area. If it's an administration department, you start going down that path. So one of the things is to understand the purpose why people do different jobs. Teaching is the one area in which it's not only driven by money. So someone may get lured initially by twice the salary, but everyone is more there because they want to make a significant, they want to be significant. They want to feel that they're leaving the world a better place than it is because of themselves. And that's their inner cause. The second thing is, people are status driven in, in their terms of significance. So if I can build a career story, so the teachers keep portfolios and within that portfolio is their career path as to, so there's an absolute training schedule as to where I will take them. So you have a team of 100 people in your central office which controls all the 100 schools. What is it that you do to inspire them to your core team? Um, again, it's all about engagement and building stories. So I'm doing something new because I want to engage people before they even join. So if I've got 100 people in my, um, in, in my um, office, if, it's, if they're there for curriculum and, and the majority of my staff are there building the curriculum, um, then they di in, interact directly with me. So at every stage, I am telling them the story. I need to understand, uh, the brain needs to understand why it's doing something across the board. Whether it's you're in a classroom or you're in your office, if your brain has a reason why it's doing what it's doing, it engages with it at a much higher level. So then the curriculum people sit individually with me because I actually build the curriculum with them. If it's brand and marketing, I'm saying I'm not, it's not typical brand and marketing. What is a story? How can you help me build this story? How can you, because I don't want to be somebody who puts an ad in the paper saying thousand franchises, the largest franchisee of India, um, you know, um, that's not in my DNA. So how are you going to build a story for me that can get people aligned and come on board for the right reasons? So for two years I went through a bad time because I had a CEO who was growth driven because the investors had, put, had pegged his everything to the growth of the company. And again, we went haywire because we got all the wrong types of franchises in who were not part of the story. So it was a misfit. It was a misfit. So you had to again do the cleanup job. I had job. to clean up and restart again. So this story goes on and it continues. What inspires you as an entrepreneur? Because every day when you wake up, there are two opportunities and four problems to solve. So how do you do it every day? What inspires you? I think one is that I don't do the same job two days in a row. Every day my job's different. Um, so I think that's really exciting because there's no, there's no, f I'm not stagnant. I'm always growing. I think I'm a teacher and because I'm so driven by self-development, um, I'm constantly learning from my kids, from my teachers, from the staff in the office. So I think it's, it's, it's personal development and growth that keeps me on. Inspiring. All the time. Yeah. How well do you understand to read a balance sheet being an entrepreneur? Zero. And again, if you want an honest answer, zero. Uh, is it because the cash flow is more than the operating cost? <laughs> <laughs> and if it, if it isn't, it's not my problem, it's somebody else's problem, right? <laughs> um, so you are more driven with your passion than the numbers which add to your bank accounts all the time, right? Oh, for sure. If, if I could, if the Indian government said to me, tomorrow you have to give all this up and join the Indian government as 
an assistant to or an advisor to the Minister of Education, etc. I can't be the Minister of Education because I have an Australian passport, unless I'd love to be, and I'm not giving up my Australian passport for anything. But if um, I would give, I would give it up in a heartbeat. I, I want to create the m most impact that I possibly can. That's my journey. You're sure on that? Yeah. What do you do with the setup? Do you donate it to good friends? Sure. <laughs> then we can influence the government. <laughs> For sure. <laughs> How do you do your expansions, Lena? How do you plan your expansions? Do you plan your expansion when an opportunity walks to you from Maldives or do you decide you have to go to Maldives? How does it happen? No, uh, mine's purely been pulled. To be very honest, I've never been able to keep up with my setup. It's always pulled me faster than I can sit back and strategize. That's a fantastic situation to be in. You don't want to expand. Expansion walks to you. You say yes to a few, no to a few and you expand. That's it? Yeah, so I basically when anybody says I want a franchise, I'm looking at alignment with, with me. As because I mean, why I say me? Because obviously the, the purpose of the company is built around one person's vision of what it should be. Um, and, I and I'm always honest with them. So my, say for instance, my Bhopal partners who've been with me for 10 years plus. Uh, when I went and did the in initial investigation, I was completely honest with them. I said, we will not be able to start this with more than 30 to 40 kids because the city is not geared or ready for it because it's revolutionary in its approach. Your mindset has to shift. You have to go away from feeling scared. I feel a lot of Indians in the education space are always scared. How will we score? How will we get into this? You have to go from a place of scarcity to a place of abundance. That the world is your oyster, everything's open out there. And in places like Bhopal where there's not enough exposure, the people's mindset has not changed. So as long as my partner, he said, I don't care. I said, if you open DPS, you'll be full overnight because that's, that seems to be a model that works on we will give you the grades. I am not about we will give you the grades. I will give you a great life is my promise to kids or parents. That your kids, if they go through my system, they'll have a great life. Um, but that great life doesn't necessarily have to be about making lots of money. It can also be that, but it's about finding fulfillment and finding everything else. So I told my Bhopal guy, partner, that Najam, I can't see more than 30, 40 kids. He said, it doesn't matter, I want to sign up anyway. We started with 65. Today he's got something like 2,000 kids. Now he's building his second school in Bhopal. Wow, wow. You are in, uh, I think you are in more cities and states in India than major of the political parties. <laughs> and what is the magic? In the sense, people want to expand, they don't get opportunities. You are not looking at expansion, it's coming walking to you. So what is the magic formula? Is it the combination of an Australian passport, a good storytelling <laughs> skill, a good looking personality, family background? Is my personality good looking or am I good looking? <laughs> <laughs> it's a combination of both. It's a combination of both. In fact, we should take you to investor speeches when we need to raise funds. <laughs> How does it happen to you or is it that you are in the right industry at the right time in the right country where the country really needs some good infrastructure for quality education. What if I tell Are you, you in the right industry? What if I tell you somebody wants to take me to Australia now? You'll still go there and change their system. No, no. So it's, I don't think it's just about being in the right country. In the right. So the unique opportunity that I had was that Indian education meant rigor. Now, for me, education is not about rigor, it's about depth, it's about interest, it's about all these other things. So I had to connect the two. So I think while America and everyone else is going through these yo-yos of education, today it's STEM, yesterday it was no child left behind, day before yesterday it was something else. I think because I've had to marry the two, we've got great results as well. So we've had IGCSE toppers, uh, ICSC state toppers, CBSE uh, uh, great results. I think it's the marriage between the two, where the kids get what they need and what they want, and somewhere we kind of make the parents feel okay about it. In spite of holding Indian passports, we find it difficult to handle the government departments. You're holding an Australian passport. How do you manage the government? Because there are so many rules, restrictions, the RT Act in place. How do you face all that? So I've been very clear about one thing. My dad left India because he couldn't handle the corruption, and he couldn't handle the under-the-table payments. 
I started this education system and the first person I went to laughed me out of the room saying, how can you, because schools were charging 400 rupees a month when I started and I wanted to charge 10 times that. I wanted to charge 5,000 rupees a month. Uh, but I said, but um, you know, kids will do everything. They won't need tuitions. They'll do all of this in the school day. And I was laughed out, so I, uh, you know, laughed out. I said, you know, you have to understand that parents like transparency. If I'm charging 5,000 rupees over the table, rather than a lack donation under the table, I think parents will respect that and, and begin admiring that. And that's exactly what happened. I've held the same in dealing with government. I have not paid the government anything under the table, ever. So recently... Do you pay them in stories? Um, you know what, recently... What happens when the income tax department comes to you? So recently the income tax department came to me. Oh, they came? And the kid was... Now, I just need to know how much I can speak because if this is being aired. But it yes. was basically asking for a settlement and the kid was a, had gone to Kangaroo Kids. I said, I, need, I said to my CA, I am not making any side deals. I will go and meet with her and get her to understand that it, the minute I become corrupt or I do anything unethical, I cannot be teaching children about ethics. Because the minute you go off your call, you've gone off your call. Lena, how do you do so much of real estate management? And how do you decide how it's to be built? Is it a regular box on box or is it something creative? So let me be honest, again, you have to go back to your core, right? I'm not um, a manager. Yeah, I'm a leader. So I build better franchises than I build my own schools. So after building the couple of schools that I had to build, I'm better at building franchises because I'm not good at the project management. I'm not good at the people management. I'm good at the inspirational management. So I can tell, I can build the great stories for parents to know why their kids should come to the school. I can build great, so I've just built the greatest new age school and it's being built in Cochin. Because the whole world has changed. Um, last year we threw out all our old curriculum, new curriculum. So one of the things, the keys are to keep on reinventing yourself. Like what is redundant? What is, what am I doing in this business because of status quo, because it's how I once did it? So which areas of the status quo do I need to break to reinvent myself to being fabulous? What does innovation and technology mean to you and how are you going to change your way of operations in the coming years? Um, so. Again, it's bre breaking the mindset of the status quo, right? Because at the moment, we send kids five days a week to school. They spend anywhere between two hours a day on a bus to whatever. Um, and if you calculate that, you're taking years away from a kid's life. Again, you can't individualize learning unless you go into the technology space, because there you can. Kids can actually go into areas that they want to go into um, and access other areas at the level of depth and breadth that interests them. Um, I kind of believe the whole face of education is going to change. No longer are we going to need to do the SATs, etc., etc. It's going to be more driven by the attitude and the habits of mind that the kids build in through the, the coming years. So I'd like to see a school where there's hubs of learning, especially in areas like Bombay that are so densely populated, where, it you know, why would I be spending so many hours on the, on the road? For me, every child, moment is a precious one. So how can I maximize joy, learning, um, and engagement in that time? Um, and take away some of the, you know, the, the, the stuff that is redundant today, like sitting in a school bus and traveling, you know, uh, for, for such. So I'm building technology conceptually around that. It's in the process. It's in the process. So we'll see it very soon happening. And it'll be different than what the other industry is doing. Two years. What the others in the industry are doing. Two years. Lovely. So friends, she is open for questions from you now. And uh, let, us, let us ask her some intelligent questions. Come. Yes, you do. Good evening, Lena. Uh, good evening. <laughs> uh, He's still scared about it. <laughs> and I'm very friendly. Huh? Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> Uh, in this uh, 23 years of uh, your experience in this industry, was the growth uh, sustainable or like was it 
10 years slow and then a leap or was it a leap from the first? I think you go through cycles, you go through cycles of growth, then you go through cycles of consolidation, then again growth, then consolidation. Some of it is driven internally and some are external forces that you can't help um, or predict. So I think it's always a, a cycle. And you know the other thing I tell entrepreneurs it's really important to do, everything's not about the destination of the business. It's the destination of the self and the journey of the self. So you have to balance with who you are and what you want out of life. Like I tell kids, I'm not into a fancy car or fancy jewelry. My dad lives in Australia and he got gifted a Lexus and he wanted to give it to me because he couldn't drive it. I said, thank you very much, keep your Lexus. One touch with another car and I've got a one lakh bill. I don't want that kind of So you of believe stress. only in expensive fees, not in expensive gifts? I don't have expensive fees either. I, I'm here for, the, for, uh, for India. I mean, obviously some form of quality will come at a price. If, 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 if I've got 24 kids in my classroom instead of 50, you've got to take that into account, right? In the equation of what I'm charging. But it's, I'm the, I, can, uh, I can say one thing, I'm the best value for money school there is. Fantastic. So you have done a value creation. Yeah. Fantastic. Excellent. Yeah, Mr. Anjaniya. Yeah, this, uh, my question is this, uh, what are the risks of these educational institutes uh, being seek in the later years? This Being what? Can, you, can you highlight some of the factors which can make these educational institutes or training uh, or teaching institutes seek? Because like other industries. This. No, so he is wanting to know whether like all the other industries like the sugar industry, cotton industry, they become sick units. What are the chances oh, of a sick, school sick, becoming okay. a sick unit? The government? The government constantly, I mean, the, the, the most dangerous part of being in education is not knowing when policies will change, how they will change, and how they're going to impact your business. So I would say that I cannot guarantee that education will not be, become a sick unit. Um, at the moment, the way the government's going, it, it can be. I mean, you've got the least amount of growth in the education sector today because people are scared of investing in education because they don't know what policy is going to come out of the hat tomorrow. So there are the future chances, but I'm sure that might not happen. Uh, yeah, Samir. Hi, good evening, Lina. Hi. Uh, what we are seeing in the postgraduate education or the higher education is a lot of emphasis on technology, on distance learning programs. Do you see this same trend happening in undergraduate schools and yeah. your kindergartens, where a student sitting somewhere far off can also get the benefit of your quality education? Yeah, that's what I'm working on at the moment. Right. So I do see that happening. Uh, yeah. I myself am doing a few future learn courses on um, in, in the neuroscience area, because that's okay. my interest. So I do see it as the future. Okay. Thank you. Rohit. Yeah, good evening, Lina. Hi. Uh, just want to know where do you hold the classes for the big kids to tell the stories? How, where, where do I do what? Yes, yeah, where do you get classes? classes for educating big people to tell stories? Big students to. <laughs> this is one such session. Okay, and uh, uh, the, the second question is you know, uh, uh, to capture from your conversation that uh, with the uh, IT guys. So, how did you manage to maintain your purity and transparency with the government system? And at, did at any point of time you just feel like you know, go, going away from this country because you were fed up? Uh, no, I'm not a quitter. So, um, I, and I don't, or I don't quit easily. So in 2006, um, a lot of things came at me because the man I was pitted against, or was, who was pitting against me, I've never pitted against anybody, um, had far deeper pockets and far more political clout. So in fact, um, I, I was, there was movement to get me thrown out of the country. So at one point, for all of 10 seconds, I sat down and I said, what am I doing this for? I've got a very wealthy family in Australia who loves me very much. Why don't I go back? Then you go back to the real reason you came. If you, we really want to impact and make a change in India, and we want to root out corruption, and we really want to do the right things, it's only if we shift the education system. So for 10 seconds, uh, you'll have to forgive me, but for all of 10 seconds, I thought of running away from this country. And then you overcame that feeling. Hi, Lena. Yes, yes, Smriti. Yeah. Uh, Lena, I wanted to know uh, when you reached that stage in 2006 where you had a pitch to investors, how tough or easy it was to sell story to the investors at that point of time and how many investors did you have to go through before you got, you know, finally got your funds in place? Again, I never pitched to investors. So I had an investor who was courting me for two years before 2006. Um, and um, um, when 2006 happened, he sent me a text message saying, I know 
your credibility is intact. I completely still believe in you and I still want to invest. Okay. Fantastic, fantastic. So I didn't have to woo anyone. <laughs> yes, Angita. Lina, good evening. You are amazing. Oh, thank you. Out of the entire network you have, how many centers are uh, company owned and how many are franchisees? First question. Second question is these Can I go one at a time? I've got a very short term memory. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, first one is um, Santa Cruz, Malad, Baroda High Schools are company owned. Uh, Kangaroo Kids, Pali Hill, and Alkapuri and Malad are, are company owned. The rest are so only six okay. are company owned, the rest are franchised. Okay, so maximum are franchise. Okay. Um, Forgetting, uh, besides the infrastructure or the commercial investments, what are the criteria to look for in a franchisee? You know, they being your business partners. What are the factors you look for? Their interest. Um, okay. It's only their interest. So is the interest purely financial? Then I would tell them to go somewhere else. Like you have an admission form for the kids. We have a profile right? match. So uh, do you check the profile of the franchisees we do. too? Do you interview them one-on-one? -on -one? We do. So I give them, when they ask me for... Um, what the business plan is going to look like, I give them the bleakest possible scenario. Okay. So only if they're completely aligned with the purpose of what, why I'm in education, because I'm not DPS. I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not a cookie-cutting um, sort of education. We're very different. We want kids to grow up being kids. We want them to find their purpose in life. We're not going to appease parents for, for grades at the cost of everything else. So there's a specific profile of a parent who comes for that kind of school. Right. Um, and therefore, it's a specific profile of partner we're looking for to come into a school like that. So I would provide, when they ask me for what a business plan looks like, they get the worst one possible. Okay. That's new. <laughs> yeah. More so, power to you. <laughs> Sangeeta, the rule of business, the more money you refuse, the more floods <laughs> towards you. And she, I think, is on the top right, on that. Right tide. <laughs> yeah, Kunal. Being in the service industry, it's difficult to scale up because you cannot control the quality that goes out from each of your centers. So how did you control your quality? Okay. And do you? All right. So it's a, we look at 360 degree for the outcome of the child, what is required. So first is I, the team of about 100 people who sit in the office doing curriculum are doing research and curriculum. So they're looking at everything in terms of how do you motivate kids, how do you engage kids, how do you connect what they're doing in the classroom to their life. Um, and how do you get the outcome, the academic outcome you want. That goes into lesson plans, daily lesson plans. So a teacher is training herself before she walks into every class. She knows what the um, uh, aim of her class teaching that day is. She's got the absolute method with all the teaching techniques and learning techniques embedded in it. And she's got a way to test the outcome. So she's got her complete 360 degree teaching system. So every day before she walks in, she knows what she's going to do. On top of that, there's external training um, for as far as the curriculum is concerned as, and as far as the other things are concerned. How do you manage behavior in a classroom? Um, how do you keep on motivating, engaging, etc.? So we've got a training team. So you've got a curriculum development team, you've got a training team, and you've got a QAG team, which is quality assurance and guidance, that go in to test and check that all the balances are in place. So anytime something's out of al alignment, and it doesn't necessarily have to be the teacher, curriculum could be bad. If in five classrooms the teaching outcome has not uh, been met, then you've got to go back to the drawing board and see the curriculum method that you've laid out. If out of five classrooms, four get the outcome and one don't, then you have to look at the teacher and where the gap is. So there's ways of using analytics to test all this. And at what point would Mr. Anthony? Yeah. Just to continue, at what point would the business run without you, your active involvement? At what stage did it come? So I'm at a good stage. Um, I was just explaining that I've got a house in Goa, and I every two weeks on Thursday I go off and I come back on Sunday. Um, I've got a because I've got a fabulous woman CEO finally, um, who is a perfect balance between understanding what my intentions and my vision is and managing the finance of the company. Um, I've had people with me for 20 years plus. Um, so the oldest person in my organization is 21 uh, years. So, and 19 years and 18 years and 15 years and they're all holding senior management positions. So they're completely aligned to the purpose and they're there for life. So I think I could f 
fairly well go off. And now with technology, there's nothing you can't do from anywhere in the world, right? Given, having said that, this is my passion. I'm, not, I'm going to do it till the day you put me in a box. So one more quality of successful people is when they make a lot of money, when they are successful, when they have delegated everything, every alternate week or every week they go and live in Goa. Yeah. <laughs> I know another gentleman, the owner of PCI, for the last 20 or 25 or 30 years, every Saturday and Sunday he is in Goa. And from the time he started doing that, he started flourishing. So, now I get the answer, sometimes, it's Goa. Sometimes you have to get yourself out of the business for the business to flourish. <laughs> <laughs> and she, the next I see at her house in Goa. Uh, it can accommodate… Everyone's welcome. It can accommodate 1000 people, we'll do with 100. <laughs> so, it's a house in the jungle and I think uh, the way she described I already and reached there. And the thing is that when I go there, I actually still do reading and research work and writing work, which is all related to my business, even though I'm supposed to be on holiday. So, all the entire content, no jokes on this, the entire content is developed by her only when she is in Goa, in that particular spot, in that particular house. That is where she writes her entire content. And mind you, majority of the content is self-created by Lena. All the stories that she tells to the children, all the storytelling that happens to the children, the entire curriculum is done by Lena. The entire curriculum is now going to get digitized so that the children can benefit across the world. I, I, I'd like to correct that so my, any of my curriculum people watching this don't get demotivated. It's inspired by me. It's created by them, but it's only inspired by me where I ask the correct questions. Okay, so, so she does the, the editing part. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Mr. Sikwera. Yeah, suppose um, anyway, after hearing you, <clears throat> I am thinking of starting a franchise of your school. In a place where your, uh, uh, where your school is not there, what are the terms and conditions? What is the <laughs> expected? <laughs> Provided we all become stakeholders without investments. <laughs> so, so, I believe that anything that happens should be a win-win on both sides. Um, we take a, uh, uh, depending on where you are, we take out an upfront fee for all the, the work that we do beforehand. And then we take 10% of your revenue. Um, and only the academic revenue, not the other stuff. So, as you grow and you earn, we grow and we earn. So, you start 100 more franchises dedicated only to pay off the free charges for Billabong. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, know. yeah. Now, if you were to define it, how are uh, the kids who joined you in 93 different from the kids who were studying in a DPS in 93? Not in terms of career, not in terms of the money that they're making, but as, as different human beings. Okay, so um, a parent put it very um, succinctly. She had a kid in uh, the Ambani school and she pulled the kid out and put the kid back with us. She, and she said, in Billabong, the child will learn how to have a social footprint um, rather than a carbon footprint. So we focus... Um, maybe 20% on the content and 80% on what we call habits of mind. Um, so what are the attitudes, attitudes you need? Um, we today can measure that people who have the spirit of optimism are more successful than th those that don't. We teach them about the four happiness chemicals, the serotonin, oxytocin, endorphins, and dopamine, and how to release those. We teach them how being grateful releases this uh, happiness chemical. We teach them how what kind of situations uh, cortisol, the stress hormone, gets released in. We teach them that uh, when you release cortisol, you create um, um, illness for your body. When you release these chemicals, you're creating healing for your body. We teach them about their subconscious mind and how it gets programmed from a very young age and how you can re-pattern and reprogram the subconscious mind. So in a nutshell, we're kind of like the Anthony Robbins of schools. So we've got all of what the Anthony Robbins teaches to adults who are broken and need to be repatterned. My philosophy is if I can teach it to kids who are very young, they don't need to end up broken. They can be f always fixed. So friends, uh, that's the end of another interesting, inspiring conversations. I would like to request uh, Devang Shah to come up and hand over the coffee mug for your Goa house. So much. I would like to request Mr. Nagu Chidamram to come up and give a memento. <laughs>